G'day guys, Mac with the Our Circle, and today, the newest part in our Getting Started in the Horus Heresy series is starting, and we're now reaching the intermediate stages of getting into the game. So we're going to be looking at Rites of War, and this episode is one that I've really stuffed around with in getting out, and the reason is because it's actually a really complicated thing, going through the different Rites of War, how they're applied, the pros and cons, and there's so many different ones, so many varied ones. How do you tackle such a project when there's two for every legion plus um, another half a dozen or so generic ones that everyone can use? It's quite difficult. So what I've tried to do um, is sort of simplify it. So rather than jump straight into the deep end by covering off on a whole bunch of random ones, I'm going to go for three which are pretty similar. And that's the Armoured Spearhead, the Head of the Gorgon, and the Iron Wing Protocol. These are all tank-heavy rites of war. So, before we get into the uh, meat of the episode, what are rites of war? Well, everyone should be familiar with the Forced Organisation chart. And how different uh, factions obviously have preferences for different styles of warfare. So, for example, the uh, Iron Hands very much fans of tank warfare in using mechanized forces motorized armored forces that sort of thing so how do you represent that on the tabletop it's a very hard thing to do without ignoring the force organization chart so instead what we have are rights of war and these allow you to step outside the bounds of the chart now the big difference here is unlike 40k 7th edition which horus heresy rules are based around you don't just get shit for free. You don't uh, just say, hey, I am playing as a, you know, Raven Guard, and all of a sudden you get a bunch of free shit. Doesn't work like that. Instead, there's always a penalty whenever you pick a force. Every Legion has its drawbacks. Some, like the aforementioned Raven Guard, they can't take more vehicles than they have units with the infantry type. Um, or units which have the Legionnaires of Studies, Raven Guard type. So that obviously limits you. Some rights of war, you're going to struggle to play them because you simply won't be able to fulfill the force organization chart requirements based on your Legion. Complicated stuff, I know. But it's very easy to get your head around. Essentially, you've got to look at what your Legion is allowed to take make sure that it fits within the rights of war limitations and then you go from there so in order to unlock a right of war you need to have a master of the legion now there's a few different ones you can go with obviously there's your special characters but the main two that 99.9 percent of people are going to pick to be the head of their force is going to be a praetor or a delegatus now a delegatus is a lower tier hq it's one of the centurion upgrades and they're sort of a light version of the Praetor. They're the guy that you send off um, to lead little strike forces from your legion in the fluff. Whereas the Praetor is your full-on head of a huge company of Astartes. So, big boss and little boss. Which one you choose for a game depends also on the amount of points you're playing. You can't take too many masses of the legion, for example. It's restricted to one per thousand points. And things like the Delegatus have a rule where if you take one, well, they have to be the boss, even if there's someone better. And that can conflict with other rules as well. So there's all these little criteria you have to meet in order to play these sorts of lists. You don't just get things for free, which is, I think, 40k's biggest hiccup that it had in the end of 7th edition was. Um, especially with detachments and formations, they give you a bunch of rules for free and there's just no penalty to taking those rules. You're not paying extra points for the special rules, you're just getting things like free rhinos, for example. Very bad way of balancing things. Rights of War, on the other hand, are a really balanced way of looking at things. So, first one here is, of course, the Armoured Spearhead. So, the effects of it are, all units in the army that are eligible to take a rhino as a dedicated transport may instead select either a Land Raider Phobos or Land Raider Proteus if they number 10 models or fewer as their dedicated transport. So this is big in that essentially any tactical squad, any unit pretty much in a Legion list can take a Rhino as a transport. Therefore, any Legion in your any unit in your Legion list, they'll be able to take a Land Raider as their transport. And that's a huge deal. 
because memory is a pretty tough things and by taking them as a dedicated transport you're freeing up those precious precious heavy support slots for other more useful items now that said you can still take rhinos if you want so you don't have to take the land raiders if you don't want to and in order to actually get the right list on the field you may have to downsize a few tanks make a few concessions and go for lighter armored units like rhinos the other effect is all tank shocks inflicted by tanks in the force impose an additional minus one leadership yeah that's pretty much never going to come into play um heresy has a lot of fearless units in forces like the mechanicum for example um it also has a lot of cheap horde infantry such as in the um militia but they are often got stubborn as an attribute or the person who you're tank shocking is probably not going to let you get that tank shop off in the first place but hey it's a free rule you may as well take advantage of it so limitations well as i said nothing's for free in the heresy and there are three limitations with the armored spearhead right of war the first is that all units with the infantry type in the army must either be um, inside dedicated transport at the start of the game or begin play transported inside another vehicle this in essence means you may not take more infantry models in your army during selection than you have transport capacity to carry so what are the things that make this difficult well first things like assault marines for example they don't have a rhino option the only way you're going to be able to get them into a force is by taking something like a storm eagle that's difficult um, terminator squads same sort of thing you're going to be limited to five-man squads unless you fork out for Spartans, and Spartans are a lot of points. Also, if you have a HQ element, which you're going to have to, because you're going to take at least a Praetor or a Delegatus to unlock this right of war, well, you're going to have to take that person and put them in a unit somewhere, because they're going to have to be deployed inside a vehicle. How do you do it? Well, you might have to purchase a Damocles Command Rhino as a HQ option, and put your HQ inside of that in order to deploy them on the battlefield otherwise you're going to be depriving another unit in your army of models they need for example a 10-man tactical squad can't go below 10 men so even though you have a land raider or a rhino to transport them in well that's no good to you because you can't make space for that hq for that character therefore you're creating problems you're gonna to have to sort of bet on taking an extra vehicle in your army no matter what the only way you're going to get away with it is by taking a nine-man unit of some kind or like an eight-man unit like a recon squad or a veteran squad a seeker squad something like that that you can put down to say eight models and put like an apothecary or a hq in it and then put that whole unit inside a land raider that's an option another limitation is should all tanks in the force be destroyed in the battle then the enemy counts as having scored an additional secondary objective well this is where things get hard because those aforementioned rhinos are very very easy to kill especially if you're first blood hunting people are going to go out of their way to kill rhinos so immediately you don't want to take them you want to be taking the heavier armored vehicles the land raiders but the thing is if you take land raiders they're going to chew up your points really fast rhinos don't so it becomes a sort of balancing act of trying to hide rhinos behind the land raiders or trying to get as many powerful units in land raiders in your army as possible um, the other thing it does it restricts your options if you're going to go for things like drop pods or storm eagles again these are things that are going to take up your points and unfortunately they don't have the tank type rule which means they're not going to help you out with meeting this victory criteria so if you spend a whole bunch of points like a thousand points on transports in your army and you've only got say three land raiders in that thousand points they've only got to kill those three land raiders to get this secondary objective now you might have a charybdis or dread claws or storm eagles these other units or termites even they're not necessarily tanks if they don't have that tank key wording they don't count therefore if they are destroyed well it won't affect the victory point but all the things that are tanks yeah it's going to affect that victory point and that means you need to have enough tanks or be careful enough with them that you know you're going to get them to survive the game just one tank at least uh last limitation is you may not take a fortification allied detachment 
Okay, that's not that big a deal because, again, this is a motorized force. You've got a lot of vehicles coming onto the board with units inside them or deploying on the board with units inside them. You're not really going for heavy support squads in bunkers, that sort of thing. It's completely against why you would take this right of war. Besides, there are other ways you can still include different heavy support elements into the army, such as jet bikes. You could take the heavy support Legion Sky Hunters. Um, you could take Sky Slayers, another jet bike option, because again, it's only infantry that are eligible to take a transport that must in order to play. It doesn't affect, um, doesn't affect those sort of things like, you know, jet bikes and bikes. So, okay, they're an option of how you might be able to vary up the force. Uh, you could still include things like uh, Land Raider Achilles, which, as I recently found out, is even better than I thought it was on the tabletop. You could also include things like um, Kestis Assault Ram, you know, strong, powerful units. It also counts as a tank, by the way, which means it's one more thing they've got to kill on the battlefield that's a tank. And it got that good transport capacity. So, you know, there's options out there you can definitely take in order to give you sort of heavy support, uh, additional firepower where you need it. So that's the Armored Spearhead Rite of War. The next one is the Head of the Gorgon. So the effects are Chosen Ground. Infantry units within the force gain the stubborn special rule while within their own deployment zone. Not hugely important. Um, again, this is an Iron Hands right of War. The Iron Hands are lucky in the regard that any shooting that's performed against their infantry is at minus one strength. Uh, that's all models of the Legion as a study's Iron Hands rule. So like bikes, jet bikes, infantry, uh, your Terminators, your Salt Marines, all that sort of stuff makes them really hard to kill because you need las cannons to ignore feel no pain missile launches don't cut it um, strength 8 templates don't cut it you need strength 9 in order to instant kill iron hands which can be brutal if you're shooting bolt guns at jet bikes and bikes you only win them on sixes and it makes a difference believe me so iron hands are bloody tough to kill and them being stubborn yeah, they're even harder to kill. They're harder to move because they can do things like put that Legion Heavy Support Squad in the battlefield, which is something that uh, other units may not necessarily have if you take, say, the generic Rite of War. But this is part of what's special about being an Iron Hand. You get access to this better Rite of War. The next effect is the War Relics. Any infantry model in the force equipped with a Flamer may upgrade this to a Graviton Gun for plus 10 points. This must be represented on the model as usual, and all vehicles in the detachment gain the Blessed Auto Simulacra upgrade for free. So, this is big. First, Graviton Guns. Fantastic weapon. I prefer it on my Terminators, as opposed to on my infantry, because it's not a weapon you can move and shoot. But Terminators being relentless can move and shoot it. And essentially it boils down to, on a 2+, plus, you glance a vehicle you hit, and on a 6, you pen the vehicle you hit. It's a good way of chipping off hull points off things like Dreadnoughts before you charge them. And it also creates an area of difficult terrain. So I like to fire my Graviton, hit a unit. That unit is then stuck in difficult terrain. And it's a good way of slowing down other Terminators. And I often spoke about using this tactic with the Graviton Cannon. Very handy on infantry, even though it's only a small blast and it's short ranged. Now, downside is they don't sell them at Forgewood anymore. They were part of the last chance to buy Debacle. They sell them in other kits, but they don't sell them as their own kit anymore. If I remember correctly, they may have re-added it to the web store and I might not have noticed. Now, the biggest thing here is that all vehicles gain the Blessed Auto Simulacra upgrade for free. This is a very similar upgrade to It Will Not Die. You just roll that dice and on the 6, I think it is, you basically gain back a hull point that you lost earlier in the battle or regen a weapon off the top of my head. Very good ability and can be taken in addition to it will not die. So you can get two chances to repair your vehicle on its own before you even bring up a tech marine or something like that. The third effect is the Iron Scions. Legio Cybernetica Battle Autonomata Maniples may be included as elite's choices within the army. In addition, any infantry unit of 10 models or less eligible to take a Rhino as a dedicated transport 
may take a Land Raider Proteus or Land Raider Phobos as a dedicated transport instead. So, right here, you've pretty much gained the benefits of the last Rod of War, which was the generic one available to everyone, in that, hey, all my infantry, they can now take Land Raiders just like the last one. But, on top of that, you can also take things like Castellax. Um, or you might be able to take uh, Vorax. And these can go in your elite slots. And these are fast units in the case of Vorax. Or very solid, hard to kill units in the case of uh, Castellax. Would you necessarily take them in an elite slot? Probably not. If I was going to take Castellax... Uh, in an Iron Hands Force, I'd take them as part of a Pravian Consul and give them the Legion Astartes Iron Hands um, Legion Astartes Rule, which will give minus one to the strength of weapons that hit them. So it means bolt guns just outright cannot hurt that unit. So it makes them very tough to kill and very scary. So it's an option. Lastly, the Armoured Encirclement, which is the last beneficial effect of the Force. Vehicles with the tank type, including dedicated transports carrying troops placed in reserve, gain the outflank special rule. So you can have things like Vindicator Squadrons outflanking. Imagine that, three demolisher cannons coming in on the side of the table and just pummeling your crap and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, really solid, really solid. Especially when the Iron Hands have special characters like Castrum and Orth who greatly boost the effectiveness of their vehicles, that's terrifying. Now, limitations. Ah, yes, there's always limitations. Again, you don't just get all this cool stuff for free. Now, detachments using this right of war may only take a single fast attack choice as part of their force organization chart. That's big, because a lot of good units are in that slot. Uh, we're talking about jet bikes, and we're talking about things like uh, storm eagles. They're two of the best units you can put there. Also, great anti-aircraft stuff is in there, like other aircraft, like uh, Xiphon interceptors, things like that, land speeders, all this stuff, I mean, that you're going to want. You're going to want some kind of anti-aircraft in your army, and almost all the anti-aircraft is located in fast attack. Now, the exception is, of course, the uh, Sikoran Arcus, which is a phenomenal vehicle, probably broken, if we're honest. But if you bring an Arcus to a game, that thing gets targeted. That thing is prioritized as a target because it is a borderline broken vehicle and people will kill it. I can tell you from previously playing an act of heresy with one, yeah, uh, I think there was one game where that vehicle survived out of four games. So well, I only used it in three of them, to be fair. But still, two out of three battles, that tank was dead by probably turn two. So, very important to note. The only reason it survived that other game was because the Blessed Auto Simulacra kept it alive. Yeah. It's a big deal. So, losing the ability to bring reliable anti-aircraft may be a problem. It limits you to things like Derrideo Trans... Uh, Derrideo Dreadnought, sorry. And the aforementioned uh, vehicle. Or, of course, Contemptors. Always bring a Contemptor. With the exception of the Forge Lord type, detachments using this right of war may only take a single console as part of their HQ choices. Now here's where things get hard. Things like the aforementioned Praetor, uh, sorry, Pravian console, with the Battle Automata. That will fill your console slot. Therefore, that's it. No other consoles, apart from Forge Lords. No Vigilators, no Masters of Signal, no Champions, no any of that. That makes your life very hard, because that means you're not taking a Delegatus or a Herald. That means the only way that you'll be running any console apart from a March of the Legion one is if you take a Praetor to unlock the Right of War. This is a huge restriction, and you don't realize it until you go to play. It means you might only take one Primus Medicae in the army. That's only one model that you could have in Terminator armor to give feel no pain to your terminators or one model you might have on a jet bike to go with your jet bike squads and give them feel no pain for those really tough jet bikes you have as iron hands it's a big deal so it is not the sort of thing to be taken lightly and lastly detachments using this right of war may not take allied space marine legion detachments again in most force orgs this is not a big deal 
But for the Iron Hands, this really can be. Because if there's one thing they suck at, it's combat. They lose all the benefits of being Iron Hands when it comes to combat. And in fact, they suffer in combat because they are slow. They struggle to chase things down. And they don't get the benefits of, say, the minus one strength to incoming weapons fire. Because they're not being fired at now. They're being punched in the face. Things like Gorgon Terminators or Iron Hands Medusa Immortals, which are tough units that I discovered recently playing with them. They can really take a hit when it comes to getting shot at. But the minute they end up in combat, especially against legions like the World Eaters, the Emperor's Children, the Blood Angels units, which are really good in close combat, you will melt. Now that's a problem because that means you're putting the entire uh, focus of your army into your ranged firepower and specifically relying on your tanks to do all the work. And whilst that's fluffy, that's a difficult game to play, especially if the other guy loads up on Imperial Knights or flying units. Flyers will push your shit in. So, difficult right of war to work with if you want to do it effectively and efficiently. It's not all bonuses in the Horus Heresy. Now, the last right of war is the Iron Wing Protocols, which is one of the Dark Angels' rights of war, and to be honest, by far the weaker of the two. The effects are interlocking fire. All vehicles with the tank type in their detachment using this right of war that are configured in squadrons increase their ballistic skill to 5 whilst their squadron contains 2 or more tanks. And this is pretty handy, especially on things like... Um, I won't say Vindicators, I'll say Vindicators with Laser Destroyers, which are a really potent anti-tank platform because you can fire up to 3 Ordnance Strength 9 um, AP... Two or go with it could be AP1 laser destroyer array shots, and you want those to hit, you want those to pen, you want them to do damage. Um, it's really good for the twin linked units. For the units that aren't twin linked, it's still just as good. Units like Predator Squadrons, for example, which obviously contain Predator tanks, could have auto cannons or they could have uh, plasma annihilators on them. So the minute you rock up with those predators and you re-rolling things like plasma shots yeah that can be really dangerous this is a really this promotes using things like predators which you don't see a lot that's pretty handy the next effect is exterminators when targeting enemy models with shooting attacks at a range of 12 inches or less any infantry model using this right of war adds plus one to their to wound rolls when using pistol rapid fire and salvo weapons with the strength of five or less it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, if you're assaulting out of vehicles like Land Raiders with assault ramps, running into combat, it's great in order to give you that advantage. You get as close as you can with the transport, drop your infantry as close as you can to the enemy, fire at them with your pistols, try and get in there with a few uh, shots early on, do a bit of damage to the enemy squad that you're firing at, um, if you can, try and kill a few models, even things up, and then go in and try and win the fight because you've already got that numbers advantage. That's a big deal. Now, is it great? No, it's not exactly a great rule because, again, within 12 inches and limited to very few useful weapons. I mean, there are weapons that the Dark Angels have, like Plasma Repeaters, for example, which are a salvo weapon. Yeah, they don't benefit from this because they're higher than Strength 5. So, heavy bolters, they don't have this either because they're strength 5, but they're a heavy weapon. So, really limited in the amount of weapons you can apply this to. The Dust of Untold Worlds. All vehicles with the tank type in a detachment using this right of war automatically ignore the first dangerous terrain test they fail and may add plus 1 inches to the distance moved when going flat out. Really good if you're trying to get your vehicles across the table that tiny, tiny, tiny bit faster, but one inch never really made the difference when it comes to flat out. Units that are going flat out are already moving very, very fast. I mean, you're talking up to 24 inches on most vehicles um, that are fast. Yeah, that's fast. Uh, is 25 inches really that much better? 1 24th extra? Probably not. Um, 
it's enough to get you if you're touching the edge of your deployment zone enough to get you one inch into the other guy's deployment zone in one move but that's about it i think the best part here is ignoring the first dangerous terrain test you fail because dangerous terrain doesn't come up very often in battles probably only one or two tests for a tank in a whole game just having this ability means you can save on dozer blades and that's probably worth it Goliaths of War. All Dreadnoughts of any type, including detachments that use this right of war, have the Fear and Tank Hunters special rules. So, your Dreadnoughts will beat other Dreadnoughts in hand to hand if they're armed with a Power Fist. No two ways about it. They will win. A Dark Angel's Leviathan with um, a Wrecker fighting a Telamon Dreadnought is going to win. Chances are, it's also going to beat most knights in close combat. By having that 2d6 armor pen combined with the fact you've got tank hunters is incredibly brutal. And fear. Fear is not a fantastic rule. It is one of the three rules that I think are really, really overrated um, by Forge World and Games Workshop. For some reason, they place a huge value in the fear rule, and yet 99% of the time, it does nothing. It, either most units are leadership 10, and always pass their tests against it or you come across a unit that's um, leadership's low but they're fearless that's pretty much the two scenarios the only time it really sort of counts is if you fight something like militia and militia hordes are fighting against you and even then it's not great not great at all so Goliaths of War good for your dreadnoughts if they're going to be going around punching other dreadnoughts and that's about it now the limitations. All infantry units in the army must begin the game deployed in a transporting vehicle with the tank type that has sufficient transport capacity to carry them. This means that dread, dread cores, um, drop pods, storm eagles, they're all off the table. They don't have the tank type. The only thing you'll be putting in them, um, if you're going to have one of those units, is something that is not infantry type. That's a problem. So, yeah, that's kind of a big deal because that means you're not taking assault marines because you must begin the game deploying a transporting vehicle with the tank type. There are no transports that can as transport assault marines except... I don't even think the Kestis can off the top of my head. Yeah, so that really limits your options on that. And Assault marines, people are probably saying right now, why the fuck would you take them? They're not great. No, they're not great. But Dark Angels have a bonus in hand-to-hand -hand when they fight units with the same ballistic skill and they're using a sword weapon. They get plus one to hit. Essentially, they go up to weapon skill five against weapon skill four. If they are weapon skill five against weapon skill five, then they go up to weapon skill six. As long as the other guy has equal weapon skill to you, you basically go up by plus one weapon skill. So Assault Marines are actually half decent here, because they'll hit other Marines on threes. That's handy, but you're not going to use them in this force. At least half of the units in the army must be vehicles with the tank type. Yeah, this gets difficult, because if you take an infantry squad, they need a tank to go with them, one for one. You take a Dreadnought, you've now got to buy another tank in another slot that's not a dedicated transport in order to go with it. When you take a HQ, a HQ is a solo unit, so therefore he needs a tank to be bought in order to cancel out the cost of him. So this really is a huge limiting factor. Even if that HQ joins another unit, stiff shit. It's what's on the army list that counts, not what you do with them in the game. So in order to take a HQ, two troops, and a Dreadnought, I need to have four tanks in the army. Now two of those will be transports for the infantry. The HQ and the Dreadnought, well, they're going to have to have something bought on their behalf. So either a vehicle squadron or two independent tanks. A huge limitation because you might not want all those tanks. You might want more Dreadnoughts and go around punching things in the face, which Dreadnoughts are really good at in this list. Now, should all tanks in the force be destroyed in the battle, then the enemy counts as having scored an additional secondary objective. So that's very similar to the first right of war we looked at today armored spearhead in fact it's identical same limitation dreadnoughts 
flyers, that sort of thing, they're not going to help you in avoiding that. It's your actual tanks, your rhinos, your land raiders, your spartans, your kestis, um, your vindicators, your predators, sikaran battle tanks. They're the things that count towards that. So, again, limits your options. You might not want to take those rhinos because they're very flimsy and you're going to be aiding the enemy towards getting that objective point. And further on top of this, your dark angels. Dark angels they cop a negative penalty if the other guy has more shit alive at the end of the game or if you lose more of your units so you could potentially be handing away up to four victory points here if you play this and you lose your vehicles that's a big deal and lastly you may not take a fortification detachment or allied detachment so again it's not hugely crippling because dark angels are good all-rounders they're not great in any one area, but they're not terrible in any one area either. So they're not like the Iron Hands who are going to suck in close combat. Because the Dark Angels, they're going to have that fact that, hey, I'm hitting the other guy, you know, on threes. That could be the make or break that, you know, wins you that fight. In a straight up fight between Dark Angels and Iron Hands is a great example. The Dark Angels are probably going to win by the maths. Now, what the dice gods do to you, well, that's that's a whole other story. The dice gods are very fickle. Um, but, yeah. So, losing allies and fortifications is not really a big deal in this factor. So, that is the first three rights of war I'm covering. Obviously, there's a lot going on here. Um, there's a lot of things you've got to keep in the back of your mind. You look at something, you go, oh, this is great, this is great, I'm getting all these bonuses... And then the limitations come in. You go, oh, fuck, I can only take, you know, one console. That's a problem. Because consoles, you know, they're very handy. Very, very handy unit to have in an army. So losing it is a big deal. It means you've suddenly got to rely on a lot of other units to do the jobs that that console normally would have helped out with. And this is where that horrible thing of trying to meet your fluff, meet the theme you have for an army, and being viable on the tabletop, clashes and good list building in 30k is about making those two things work together because no good to be super fluffy and lose every game because no matter how optimistic you are as a person that grinds your gears after a while you've painted all these models you're really just happy to be here and you just have to keep pulling them off the table that's not enjoyable you know that's something you can do at home is just knocking models off a tape and same token, if you're that guy that's a whack faggot and you go out and you're just like, oh, I love to play and I love to kick ass, it's all about winning, I don't care about the other person's enjoyment, well, you're going to have a hard time because the community is probably going to ostracize you. So you got to find that nice balance between the two. And Rights of War will let you find a balance if you play them smart. So I'm back with the Outer Circle. Thank you all for watching this episode. There'll be more Rights of War soon, probably another month or two. Um... The next big video I'm going to be doing is going to be the second part of the Warhammer Fantasy End Times. And I'm not really looking forward to it. I've been trying to cram in the books and it is painful. These books are atrociously written and rushed is the optimal word of choice. So, yeah. Don't know why I agreed to the viewer request to look at those. I'm an idiot. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all next time.